Hi guys, welcome to another Monday night study. We've been going through the book of Enoch. And just to remind you, we've went through the introduction to the Enoch prophecies in the book in general. We looked at the part two, which is the end time outline, chapters one to five. We're now in part three, which is taking a lot longer, and that's chapters six to 16. That's actually fallen angel history, Nephilim and that kind of stuff. We went through chapters six through the first part of 10. We also looked at the Dead Sea Scroll called the Book of Giants or those fragments. So we got to see about Genesis 6 and Jude and 2 Peter and the genetic tampering and the uh, prophetic dreams. So now we're up to, we did a little more of the history last week. So now what we're going to do is look at the rest of chapter 10 and 11, which is actually a prophecy. So we're going to break from Nephilim history for a second, just going through the book as it entails. But this is a really interesting one because we're talking about a prophecy of 70 generations. So it answers several questions like what is a generation? How do prophecies work? When is the Messiah going to be born? And we're going to see some interesting things because that means that the ancient world knew about the Messiah, which makes sense. That's what the scrolls say. But it also they also knew or approximately when the Messiah would come. So let's delve into that. So today we want to look at this prophecy here, and I'm going to point out several things to you. Um, but what we just looked at for this part is about Azazel. Uh, being chained because of what he did, where he's chained up. And we made mention last week that there are four angels, according to the book of Revelation, chained under the Euphrates River. So we're going to look at that here just a little bit. So he's bound. And if you want to know about that, look at last week's. So when we get down here, verse 11 to the end, and this is from our modern English uh, version of Enoch that we did a few years ago. Uh, but you can compare this to the standard ones. I guess the standard one still is R.H. Charles from about 100, 150 years back. So he says, this is the um, the judgment, what's going to happen. So he, he condemns and judges Azazel and that group. Now we're going to go talk to uh, Shimyaza. Remember, that's the leader of the second group that rebelled, that came down on Mount Hermon, the 200 angels. So, <clears throat> the Lord said to Michael, go and tell Shemyaza and his associates who have defiled themselves by marrying women, that they and all those they contaminated will be destroyed. So this is the coming flood judgment. When they have seen their sons slay one another, and their loved ones destroyed, bind them for 70 generations under the valleys of the earth until the day of their judgment and of their end, till their last judgment be passed for all eternity. So let's look at this real careful. First off, we see all through the Old Testament, this whole concept of when God sends judgment, Sometimes he'll have angels do things, but a lot of times he'll send what's called confusion. And you get to see this several times in the Old Testament where groups will try to attack Israel. <clears throat> and uh, they will get confused and think the other side of the army is Israel and attack themselves. Um, in Kings and Chronicles, the probably the, the heights of one of those stories is where the priest or the prophet tells Israel, not even to gird up in uh, armor and swords, but just take a knapsack and everyday clothes. Go out to the battlefield, sit on the side of the mountain, and watch what the Lord does. And then I think it was Edom and Moab. I'd have to look it up. But they decided to come to attack and destroy Israel. They got confused because the Lord sent confusion on them. And Edom and Moab each thought the other was Israel, and they attacked and slaughtered them. So Israel just sat and watched until everyone was dead. And then the prophet said, now take the knapsacks, go out and get the loot, go home and rejoice in the Lord. Because you know you didn't have anything at all to do with this. It's got nothing to do with the might of Israel. This is something the Lord does. And we mentioned that in uh, Ezekiel 38, 
when we have the Gog Magog war, if you read on down, part of that is that the Lord sends confusion to the people and they kill each other. So this is kind of a standard thing. It's interesting to think how, how God could attack or, or change something in a thousand different ways. Super easy for him. So in this case, this is what's going on. So let me let's look at a couple of things here. Um, let me see here. Bring up my e-sword. This is Revelation 9. And this is the... Um, we, in, in Revelation, during the tribulation period, we have the, the seals, and then the trumpets, and then the vials. And in this case, it's the sixth angel, a six out of seven. There's seven of them that sound. When they sound their trumpets, certain things happen. So this says, this is Revelation 9, 13 to 15, we want to look at. It says, the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. This voice here comes from the altar and says to that sixth angel, which had the trumpet, loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour, a day, a month, and a year, for to slay the third part of men. Now, this is interesting to me because. What I'm trying to show you out of Enoch is that prophecy we just looked at is not one specific prophecy. It's three. And it's very clear when you look at the text. So I want to start off by saying somewhere along the line, in the middle of the tribulation, or second half of the tribulation, somewhere in there, there are four angels that have been bound since before John wrote this, at least. We have no idea who they are, or what they're doing or anything from, from this text. But there's four angels that are bound or chained under the Euphrates River somehow. And they will stay there until the middle of the tribulation period when they're loosed. And they're loosed specifically or allowed to do whatever it is they want to do, which apparently is to destroy a third part of men. Now, from this text, we don't know if that's a third part of a certain army, a third part of the people over there. A third part of the entire planet. Uh, but either way, this is this is pretty specific. These angels can't do anything right now because we're not in the tribulation period. Somewhere along the line, they're loosed. Now, this, what I want to point out to you, this, this is before the second coming. This is before um, the great white throne judgment. And obviously after the second coming or the, after the first coming, rather, sometime in the tribulation period. Okay, so let me go back here. So notice this. So the the this is pre-flood, the last hundred years or so before the flood. And Shemyaza and those other 200 are bound to a point, but they're allowed to see what's going on. And God sends a civil war between the three giant clans. We've seen a little bit of that in the previous chapters. And we'll see a little bit of that when we go from this text into uh, Jubilees. We'll see what happened after the flood and how the how the uh, Nephilim came back and a little bit about that and some of the prophecies about right before the second coming. But now notice this, though. Uh, they're going to see their sons slay one another. There's going to be the civil war between the giant clans. And we know there's the giants, the Nephal, and the Elud, So, and then the subgroups of those. So it says at this first point, bind them for 70 generations under the valleys of the earth. So the valleys of the earth, I think, is interesting because we've already seen that Azazel is in a place called Ber Hadudo, which is 12 miles outside of Jerusalem, Israel. And these other four, just four of these, and there's 200, of course, that came down, but four angels that are chained under the Euphrates. Now, this says that they are chained, his associates, under the valleys of the earth. Now, a valley is the opposite of a mountaintop, so we're talking about the lower places. And when water shift, that's kind of where lakes and rivers and that kind of stuff is. 
So we don't know exactly where this is. They may be scattered all over. Who knows? <clears throat> but that leads us to believe, assumption, but still leads us to believe those four angels from Revelation are probably four of this group. So Azazel in one spot, four of them under the Euphrates. And we, we say that like it's one spot, but the Euphrates is hundreds of miles long. They could be a great distance from each other. So, but in this case, I want you to look that first off, they're going to be bound. Okay. And then there's one part of this is 70 generations later, something happens. So everybody is bound for at least 70 generations. A lot of people look at this and say, well, a generation is random. It just 70 just means the top of everything. So for eternity or whatever. No, it means exactly what it says. And this particular place, because we can check it by scripture, we know this particular number hasn't been changed. So there's 70 generations. And then there's until the day of their judgment and of their end. And until the last judgment be passed for all eternity. And this is not saying that their judgment will be eternal. This is for eternity or before eternity starts, there's going to be a last judgment. So what we see here is a first coming, a second coming, and the end of the millennial reign. These are like key times or events. First coming is when the Messiah comes. Second coming is when he comes back again, and that's going to be right before that seven year period is right before the second coming. So it's attached, so to speak. It's basically all the same time period. If you take like even a decade or something or a Shemitah, it's a seven year period. But in that time period, at least four angels are loosed. And so there's things going on. So they're bound uh, until something happens at the first coming, the 70 generations. Something happens at the second coming or right before the second coming. And then something happens uh, with the, the major judgment at the great white throne judgment. Now, with that in mind, let's look at one thing here. We looked at Revelation 9. Let me go over here. This is Paul in 1 Corinthians 6. He's talking about how you and I shouldn't be taking each other to court. Because whether, whether or not I say I'm a Christian and I really am not, it, it doesn't really matter because people will look at it and say, here's two guys that say they're Christian and they're suing each other in court. Obviously, Christians can't get along and it's a bad witness. So he's talking about that. And he's trying to explain the fact that you ought to be able to judge yourself. If I do something weird, you should reprimand me. And if I don't pay attention, I should be excommunicated from your church. That's the way it's supposed to work. And you should have the power to do that kind of thing. In the process of explaining this, he says, um, verse 2, Do you not know that the saints, that's us, will judge the world? And if the world shall be judged for you, are ye not unworthy to judge the smallest matters? If you're going to have some sort of a judgment, uh, or if we're going to be judges and rulers, in the millennial reign, we ought to be able now to have a little bit of common sense and judge amongst ourselves, at least, is what he's saying. But then he goes on in verse three and says, do you not know that we shall judge angels? Now, how much more than things that were happened to this life? And then he goes on talking about other things. So the question you might ask is, whoa, where did Paul get the idea that we're going to set in judgment over angels? I mean, he clearly says that, but is this something that was revealed to him? Which it could be. But the way he's saying this, don't, doesn't everybody know this? Don't you remember? Uh, we judge ourselves. We're setting in judgment. We're rulers, you know, in the, ne in the next age. We even judge the angels. Remember that whole story? Remember the, doing it? Don't you remember this stuff? And if that's the case and you're filled with the Holy Spirit now, you ought to be able to judge yourselves. I mean, come on, let's let's get it together is what he's saying. But where did he get the idea that we're going to set in judgment on angels? Well, it's mentioned in Enoch chapter 10. So that's one of the real cl clear points. So Paul is referring to it, not a direct quote, but referring to Enoch here. 
and the fact that we judge in the millennial reign and we see that mentioned a little bit clearer in the book of revelation and let me um okay we'll come right back to here in a second so um the angels are hidden in various places under valleys under the earth for and there's a 70 generations which ends at the first coming there's the day of their judgment uh coming to an end the day of that part of the judgment coming to an end because some of them get out and that is right at the second coming and then the last judgment to be passed for all eternity which is at the end of the millennial reign so we're seeing those things so let's go ahead we'll come right back to this because i want to explain fully the 70 generations in those days they will be led off to a fiery abyss to torment and to prison which they will be confined forever and whosoever was not was condemned rather whosoever was condemned and destroyed will from henceforth be bound together with them to the end of all generations now we've got to be careful about this um, all generations can mean like everything obviously the generational count ends at the when eternity starts for sure but we can also be referring to the ages so like everything continues until the end of an age sometimes you'll talk about till the end of the world and people think that's you know millions of years out or whatever well the end of the first age ended about four thousand years ago the end of the second age ended about 2000 years ago the end of our age according to their calendar is in 51 years so this is 2024 so basically so anyway um and again their calendar could be off i could be interpreting it wrong but that's the way the language is used um so destroy all the spirits of the reprobate the children of the watchers because they have oppressed mankind destroy all the wrong from the face of the earth and let every evil work come to an end so this is not that evil doesn't exist anymore it's um that what they're doing is to be destroyed they're going to be destroyed by a civil war there's going to be a flood and then whatever else they did to clean up the mess so and then we get into the millennial reign it says and let the plant of righteousness and truth appear to prove to be a blessing now at first when we we're looking at this i wasn't sure what a plant of righteousness is but when you go through all the other scrolls they make it very clear the concept is the lineage of the messiah and ultimately the messiah himself so the plant of righteousness in this time period that we're talking about here is from adam to noah the 10 patriarchs pre-flood after the flood we get the other the lineage and that's going from adam through shem down to abraham and then god makes a promise with abraham and then isaac and then jacob and then jacob changes his name to israel he has 12 sons that start the 12 tribes of israel and then that is the nation the messiah comes from so at this point the plant of righteousness is basically noah and his family so they need to be protected and they need to make it through the flood uh, if it was uh 300 years later we'd be talking about abraham and then isaac and then jacob and then the children of israel the the nation has to be protected maybe punished in babylon but they have to come back and etc and then eventually the messiah comes and then the messiah is the one we're looking for and of course his church is, is a holy plant so we're going through basically it's the messiah and the believers but at this point there are no uh the messiah hasn't come yet so we're tracing that lineage so this will let the plant of righteousness and truth appear and it will prove a blessing the works of righteousness will be planted in truth and joy forevermore so the messiah when he comes the first time takes care of the sin problem the, and the sin problem is partially genetic at least so all that stuff's taken care of as the zealous put away what the angels were trying to do is put away our sin nature is put away everything's fixed as far as what god can do now we still have to accept jesus christ as our savior but the the 
the saving part has been done. And then when he comes back to start the kingdom, another major part will be done. Like you and I will have resurrected bodies. Okay. When all the righteousness escape, when all the righteous rather escape and live till they could beget a thousand years. So this is not saying that they will beget or excuse me, a thousand children. This is not saying that each person will have a thousand children, but the lifespan, if you could live to a thousand years and you could have one child every single year, you would have about a thousand children. So it's like they could. So this is a kind of an idiom or a phrase. The righteous will all uh, escape through the tribulation. Those, those tribulation saints that don't die, not us that are, have become immortal, but the other guys will, and they will live to about a thousand years. Now, Isaiah and other places talk about how if someone was to die during that age, uh, less than a hundred years, it's like a baby dying. I mean, a hundred years old, you, you haven't even really started anything yet. So the lifespans go back to close to a thousand, the way it was pre-flood. Okay, and it says, and all the days of their youth and old age, they will complete in peace. There won't be any more wars. Remember, another thing that Isaiah says is that the lion lays down with the lamb, uh, the wolf with the sheep. Uh, and basically talking about nation will not make war with nations anymore. Uh, if the Gentile nations refuse to pay homage to the Messiah, the Messiah withholds the reign. And so everybody begins to understand that this is going to be ruled with a rod of iron. And uh, no one will be allowed to attack another nation. There's going to be crime, according to Revelation, there's still going to be whoremongers, thieves, stuff like that. People will still have a sin nature. Satan will be gone, so it'll be much better. But the nations will not be allowed to make war. So it's a lot of things are going to be different. So from the days of their youth all the way to their old age, they will just die in peace. There won't be any time of war until the very end of the millennial reign. Then the whole earth will be tilled in righteousness. And all will be planted with trees to be a peaceful, uh, a full blessing. All desirable trees will be planted on it. They will plant vines on it. The vine which they plant will yield wine in abundance. And each seed that is sowed will bear a thousand. And each measure of olives will yield, yield ten presses of oil. So this is all uh, talking about basically. Um, Again, everything re returns to a uh, pre-flood era. Uh, the thorns and thistles are probably gone. Uh, everything works in abundance. There's plenty of food. There's no war and destruction. So obviously there's plenty of food. So we're, ta we're definitely describing the millennial reign here. And it goes on and says, cleanse the earth. Now, so this is what's going to happen. Now we're talking to those angels again. Cleanse the earth from all oppression unrighteousness, sin, godlessness, and all the uncleanness that is wrought upon the earth, destroy it from off the earth. And then all the children of men will become righteous, and all the nations will worship me, and will praise me, and all will, will worship me. The earth will be cleansed from all defilement, sin, punishment, and from all torment. I will never again send a flood of water upon it from generation to generation forever. And we see the same promise in, in Genesis. So the world was destroyed once by a flood of water. It will next be destroyed by a wave of fire. But never again will the water happen. And it goes on and says, in those days, I will open the store chambers of blessing which are in the heavens and send them down to earth over the work and the labor of the children of men and the truth and the peace will be associated together throughout all the days of the world and that could be all the all the days of that age so that during the tribute uh, during the millennial reign rather everything will be peaceful and much better 
and throughout all the generations of men. So that's what we'll stop here. This next part gets into some other Nephilim history from chapter 12. But so to, to sum this up, um, let's look at this again. So we're back up here. So the 70 generations prophecy, again, is part in, is in three pieces. So first they... <clears throat> Uh, the angels see their sons do a civil war and kill each other, and then everyone is bound. Okay, so some of them are bound, apparently, for 70 generations when something happens. And then others are bound until the second coming when something happens. And others are bound all the way through to the end, the great white throne judgment of eternity. So it, we're looking at these three. So the 70 generations is when the Messiah actually fixes everything. That's the first coming, when he died on the cross, and that took care of the sin nature and all the other problems. So let's look at this. So there's a 70 generation count. And what this is, if you go back and look at it, we're starting with Enoch and going forward. There's going to be 70 generations. A lot of people ask, what is a generation? It could be 50 years or 40 years or 70 years or 80 years or 120 years. And properly, a generation is not a time period of years. It is literally a generation. So, and I've, I've tried to explain this before, but if I uh, was born and say when I was 15 years old, I had got a girl pregnant and we had a baby. Well, then my generation is 15 years. Now, instead of that, let's say I wait until I'm 40-ish and I get married and I have a baby boy when I'm 50 years old. Well, then that generation from my birth to his birth is 50 years. So you can't put a certain number on a generation like this. Now, later on in the manuscripts, they will start using the words jubilee and generations interchangeably. So some prophecies will have a generation as a 50 year period. And that's very important for us to see uh, how the prophecies affect the second coming. But in this case, it's 70 generations to the Messiah. So I wanna show you something. If we go to, um, and let me pull this up again, go to our next passage. This is Luke chapter three. And this is very, very interesting, I think, if you look at it. We're talking about John the Baptist and the things that happened with Caiaphas. And then when we get down to uh, verse 23, we talk about the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Now, it's in a couple of different places. And this one is slightly different from the one in Matthew. Now, Church Father Eusebius tells us why. This is the legal uh, lineage and the other is the biological lineage. And so there's a little bit of a difference. But I want to point out several things to you in this. So let's just start reading this. We're going to read part of this. And then I want to compile it for you. So Luke 3, 23 says, Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age. So he's about 30 years when he gets baptized into priesthood, Melchizedekian order reestablished. Uh, but he's about 30 years old, okay? And being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph, which was the son of Heli. So this is, this is not saying that he's illegitimate or that people supposed he was, but he's not. It's kind of a, probably a bad translation, but the legal son of Joseph, okay? And so now we know Joseph wasn't the biological father. Mary was the biological mother. And the Holy Spirit was the biological father, uh, according to scripture. So that's what we're talking about there. But notice we've got Jesus then, and then he's the first generation. Second generation going backwards would be his father, Joseph. Third generation, which is grandfather, would be Heli. Heli's father was Mathat, uh, and then his father was Levi, and his son was Melchi. And it just goes all the way down. So we get down to um, uh, David, uh, Nathan through David, Jesse, Boaz, goes all the way back down to Lamech and all the way back down to 
uh, Adam, which was the son of God. So he's showing the lineage here, and it's really important, a direct kingly lineage going from Adam through Noah, through Shem, through Abraham, uh, it's all the way down through Levi, and on down to Joseph, who was the legal father of Jesus. Now, what I want to point out to you here, you can do this here, but I've already done it for you. I want to show you one other thing. Um, here is a chart of the 70 generations. Now, we're going down the same way, so we know it's Jesus. His father is Joseph. His father is Heli. His father is Mathat. His father is Levi, and it goes on down. So we've numbered these for you. So we get down to number 10. We go down to, uh, and these are just from Luke chapter 3. Uh, we go down through all of these guys, and here's Nathan and David and Jesse and Obed and Boaz and Solomon, Aram, Perez, Judah, Jacob, Isaac, Abraham, Terah, which they say is Sarah. It's just a Greek version of it. Nahor, Sarah, and all, all the way down, Eber, Arphaxed, Shem, which they have as Sem, Noe, which is Noah, Lamech, Methuselah, Enoch, Jared, and all the way down to Adam. Now, what I want to point out to you here is, if we start by Jesus as the first generation and just count back 70 generations, we get to Enoch. So the prophecy, this is the book of Enoch we're, we're looking at. The prophecy is, number one, the problems will be fixed in three stages. Number one, the Messiah will come that will pay for our sin nature, fix all of these genetic problems. We're still going to have them, but the penalties are fixed. We do have the ability to have eternal life. It's a free gift. And it will happen 70 generations after Enoch. And sure enough, according to Luke, 70 generations after Enoch is Jesus Christ. Now, uh, if we had time, I would go through and show you there's some other scrolls like the uh, Testament of Nathan, where he's talking about uh, the Messiah being born of a generation, or born of a virgin, rather, and it's many generations off. And the way he explains it is like, yeah, everybody knows this. And so it's interesting to me, and then David actually gives Solomon the, the information about this is something that you keep secret, but you got to understand if one of our daughters right now ended up pregnant, not married, she would be put to death. So you've got to be on the lookout for one of our daughters, and you got to tell your people this. Someday there's going to be one of our daughters, direct descendant from us, that all of a sudden is pregnant. She's not a fornicator. She's not to be put to death. She's the mother of the Messiah, you know, and we understand this, this generational count. So it's really interesting to see this. So this is the part of that threefold prophecy, the first coming, the second coming, and the great white throne judgment. And in this case, Enoch is the 70th, and it's the seventh from Adam, of course, but Enoch starting and going forward 70 generations is the Messiah. And when he comes, he fixes everything. Uh, incidentally, the one manuscript is probably my favorite Dead Sea Scroll is 11Q13. And it specifically says that the Messiah is the Melchizedekian priest who actually is God incarnate. And he comes uh, to pay the penalty for our sin nature, which reconciles us to God. And it also starts the age of grace. So apparently he comes at the end or towards the end of that time period, sometime before 75 AD. But then it goes on and says the event where he fixes everything is exactly one Shemitah after the end of the ninth Jubilee of that Ona. And of course, that comes out to be 32 AD. Now, I'm not trying to be super specific, 30, 31, 32, 33, somewhere in that neighborhood. Calendars can be off. But the point is, they specifically knew the Messiah would be God incarnate, would come and die for our sins at a certain event. So they were looking for the Messiah. They believed all the prophecies. And they got these specifically from the Testaments. And they interpret the Old Testament through the Testaments. So very, very interested in this. Now, one thing I want to mention to you, a lot of people ask about this. 
when you're looking at these things, you go Enoch, Methuselah, Mac, and Noah, and then Shem, and then Arphaxad, and then Canaan, and then Shelah, Eber, Peleg, Ru, and on down like that. In the New Testament, this is mentioned here, this guy named Canaan. When you go back and you look at the Old Testament, this guy is not mentioned here. And there's this big debate on whether Canaan, is, was it a typo? Should it be in there? Is one text wrong, one text right? And it's the same kind of a situation we have when we compare Luke and Matthew, because they're identical to a certain part. In the last three or four generations, they kind of go off and kind of come back with note with uh, Joseph and, and Jesus. And we're talking about a legal, biological, a legal lineage and a biological lineage. That's why they're slightly different. Kind of like marrying the family. They call him dad, but he's not the biological dad, you know, that kind of thing. So what happens here, everybody's like, well, then who is this Canaan? Was he a real guy? There's no record of him, et cetera. One of the texts that we'll see, and when we continue to study Nephilim history, is that this guy here, he was um, considered legally a son of Arphaxad. And I don't know the details to it, but it's one of those kind of legal things. And remember, this is the legal one, not the biological one. So what's happening is we have the text that tells us that Canaan uh, apparently was adopted or, or that kind of a thing into the family. And he came up uh, presumably having a little bit of an authority to do so. And he, he's actually Canaan, the son of uh, grandson of Ham, rather. But he somehow winds up being in the family of our faction. And he's the one that comes up and he finds Zidon. And one of the things he does is very quickly going over to Mount Hermon and kind of looking through archaeological digs and stuff. He finds the records of the watchers and decides he's going to emulate this. Just he doesn't know anything about it. There's no angels around or anything, but the records. And we, we looked at some of these records a couple of weeks ago, how you do the genetic tampering. It's actually in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Book of Giants. So he gets the same kind of information. And decides, okay, I'm going to try to do this experiments and do it the same way. Apparently, he was successful because shortly thereafter, you have giants in the land of Canaan. And Noah, uh, or not Noah, but Moses, when he leads the children of Israel out, they come into the land of Canaan under Joshua. And they have to destroy these giants. And Abraham has problems with some of the giants, along with Kittily Omer. So there's quite a bit of a record of this. So the answer to some of those questions are, no, this is not a typo. Yes, there really was a Canaan, son of Arphaxad, at least legally. Uh, and we know where he came from and we know what he did. So we know why this is in here, because it's part of the actual legal prophecy, the 70 count. Um, but not biologically, he's not somebody you'd want to claim to be. Yeah, my dad's the one that brought back the giants. So this is the situation going on. We'll see the rest of that history with him later. Just wanted to make mention of that because a lot of people ask whether this is legitimate or not. So that's basically our study for tonight. So basically, uh, we're still in the fallen angel history. This has been a, a teaching on that 70 generation count. So again, a generation is from father's birth to birth of the firstborn son or whoever takes over, you know, if, if we're the lineage of kings. So it's not a direct history or a certain time period. It's a generation. Um, and then we see that with the prophecy of Jesus' birth. And you could figure this up. You could start looking at the flood and go back at when Enoch was born, Methuselah was born, and when Jesus was born on their timeline, you could sub sub subtract them divide by uh, 70. And I think you come out with like 48.9 or something like that. So it's right out of Jubilee, an average of Jubilee periods. And uh, it comes to be interchangeable like that for that period. So the question we might have for this is when Jesus says that generation shall not pass until all these things are fulfilled, what is he talking about? A 120 year period, a 50 year period, just somebody is still alive that was alive then, an actual generation. 
And when you're talking like that, though, when you say this generation will not pass until everything's fulfilled, he might be meaning that, but it's a very odd way of saying it. Somebody will still be here when it happens. I would assume so. Somebody would still be here when it happens. So we're probably talking about a jubilee period. And people have always looked at that and said, okay, that's the most logical, but 50 years from 1948 would actually be 1998. And that's way past. So, you know, well, maybe it's 67, 67 plus 50, you know, would be 2017. Now that's past two. So it's like, how do you figure this kind of stuff? If you're looking at the calendar, and we'll discuss that here in chapters 72 to 82, the Enoch's calendar, uh, the Dead Sea Scroll calendar. If you're using their calendar, then you know Messiah came the first time in 32 AD. And you know the last generation starts in March of 2026. So we're talking about a year and a quarter basically from now. Um, the the ju well the jubilee year of this of this fifty year period starts in a, in a year. Then after that we have a, a fifty year period of seven shemitas in a year. So all the prophecies will be fulfilled at that point. That doesn't mean that some of the prophecies can't be fulfilled now. It's just that last generation. Everything will be finished but before the end of that 50-year uh, period. So we've actually got a lot of prophecies. We've got the Psalm 83 war, destruction of Damascus. You're talking about uh, the things that happened to Jordan and to Egypt. You're talking about the war between uh, Iran and, and Israel. You're talking about the Gog Magog War, which is the Russian invasion. And there's still a lot of things like that. There were several prophecies about Hamas, an actual group called Hamas that was supposed to be the government structure in the Gaza Strip, Gath of the Philistines, as it says in scripture. And we've already seen that. It's not finished yet, but it's in process, those prophecies. Uh, so there's going to be a lot of other prophecies happening. Uh, again, some of those have started way back when uh, Israel became a nation in 1948. So well over two jubilees back. You know, we've had, well, not quite, almost two jubilees back. We've had that. And uh, into three jubilees back, you've got the uh, Balfour Declaration. In the late 1800s, you've got the Jewish Convention under Herzl. So there's been a lot of things going on over this time period. So we'll go ahead and stop there for tonight, and I will switch over to the chat and see if there's any questions. So, okay, first question. When you say the Antichrist is revealed, do you mean when he comes into the world and is seen as a peacemaker or when he enters the Holy of Holies? Um, I would say it's when he comes into the world as a peacemaker. And the reason I say that is because um, if, if there's a pre-trib rapture, then the Christians will be gone. People will know something's up. They will start looking for a guy to make peace whose name equals 666 when spelled in Greek, who is the king of a ruler north of Israel, who attacks Egypt and causes the Nile River to be destroyed. There's a ton of prophecies. So when you start looking for those things, it becomes pretty obvious. And this is all well before he actually sets in the temple claiming to be God. For those people that aren't Christian, that don't know anything about prophecies, they're not going to even recognize him when he does set in the temple and proclaim to be God. They're not going to say, oh, that's the Antichrist. So it's really interesting for that. If, on the other hand, if, if there's a mid-trib or post-trib or something like that, if, if we're still here during that time period, he will be spotted immediately because we're always looking for 10 nations or 10 groups of something. We're always looking of somebody doing a covenant of some sort. It's a seven-year period, and we all know the other prophecies. So when something like that happens, he will be spotted immediately. So the revealing of the Antichrist is that beginning of that tribulation period. Whether there's a mid, pre, or post, or whatever type rapture, it's still going to be the revealing is at the beginning. 
Good question. Um, let's see. Why in Matthew does the generations mention Joseph instead of Mary's bloodline? Um, it's the uh, biological is what we're doing. And basically, we're going through um, the kingly line. It's always the, the male. So it's uh, my ancestry would go through my dad, my grandfather, my great grandfather on the on the male side. That's how you would do any kind of king or priest or anything, how they did it back then also. And so Mary's genealogy is not super important. Uh, it, there, there are some prophecies about Mary's genealogy, uh, some records about that, and John the Baptist's genealogy, and a few things like that. But the important thing is that Jesus is a direct descendant of King David. That's one of the, one of the prophecies. So he's saying, okay, here is the lineage of Joseph the legal uh, um, genealogy. And then Matthew was saying, well, here's the biological one. So if some people are going to argue, well, anybody can adopt anybody. So the, the or, you know, or, or marry into the family. Uh, so that's not really the prophecy. Well, Matthew proves that biologically he is the Messiah. And Luke proves legally that he is the Messiah. So two different ways of doing it. You'll notice they're identical except the very, very tail end. So Mary's uh, bloodline is important, but not for what they're talking about. Uh, God bless you. Thank you. In Mark 15, 42, it says that Jesus died on the cross the preparation day, Friday. But wasn't it Wednesday? Yes. Uh, the preparation day was preparation for Passover. And the confusion happens because we have a weekly Sabbath. And the weekly Sabbath is Friday night and Saturday. Always is. But a high Sabbath, which is like Passover, Pentecost, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, all the holidays. Uh, those are high Sabbaths. But the point is a holiday and a weekly Sabbath are both called Sabbaths. So if he died right before the Sabbath, if that's all the text says, you don't know if that would be Thursday night or Friday, you know, before the weekly Sabbath begins, or if it's the day before a festival. So in Mark, it actually tells us preparation day. So, you know, preparation day is the 14th of Nisan, which is the day before unleavened bread begins. So it's Passover day. So he's dying on Passover. And because Passover day or preparation day is a the day before a Sabbath, they're assuming, okay, that must be Thursday because Friday is the Sabbath. And it would be if we're talking about the weekly Sabbath. Let me uh, pull something up here. This is our DSS calendar. And we'll just go to this, this year's, well, this one here. Um, so here is 2023. And the way they do this is, Spring equinox is the beginning of the year, and it's always the Wednesday closest to the spring equinox that has actually New Year's. So it always starts on a Wednesday. So this would have been the same on their calendar all the way through. So Passover is the 14th of Nisan, which is Tuesday night and Wednesday. Okay, everything starts in the evening the day before. So Tuesday night and Wednesday is Passover or preparation day for the 15th which is a high Sabbath. So that's the, the Sabbath day. And then you also have a Friday Sabbath day, a low Sabbath and a high Sabbath. So in this case, Jesus has his uh, Passover meal with his disciples Tuesday night and then goes out and gets arrested, tried the next morning and put on the cross that morning. So that's still the 14th of Nisan. Okay. And then he's taken down before the 15th, which is a high Sabbath begins, and he's put in an airtight tomb. So he's in the tomb, the prophecy says, for three days and three nights. So that's Wednesday night and, and Thursday, Thursday night and Friday, Friday night and Saturday. So sometime after sundown on Saturday, he resurrects. Now, according to the text, they come on Sunday morning and the tomb that stone has been rolled away and he's gone so it's already happened sometime between dusk on saturday night and when they got there sunday morning so sometime during the night 
So he was in the grave for a full three days and three nights. And when you look at it that way, it's absolutely perfect, uh, according to the prophecies and the fact that it's Passover and it's the day before a Sabbath. It's the, the high Sabbath or the festival, not the weekly Sabbath. Um, have you ever done or plan to do an in-depth look at the Shepherd of Hermas? I don't think I have online, but that would be something interesting to do. Uh, the Shepherd of Hermas, according to uh, the Church Fathers, was written by a church father. So it's not something we should add to the canon, but it's like two or three generations out. And it may have some interesting things in it. It's one of the one of the things that talks about a pre-trib rapture, actually, in the Shepherd, among other things, too. So it's got some interesting things in it. But I don't think I have. If we do, we'll we'll make a playlist off of it and keep it on YouTube. And in our network, too. We don't do any broadcasting, really, on Facebook. We've done a lot of that, and it just hasn't worked out too well. Not that we've had problems, but we just don't have too many followers. But we do have uh, YouTube and Rumble and Odyssey, and we have our own network, uh, which is separate from everybody else. So on the network, we can talk about whatever, and we don't have to worry about things. Uh, but our major following is on YouTube, so we're trying to do just the scrolls and the prophecies in, in a non-threatening way to the unbelievers, I guess. <clears throat> um, in the DSS, Dead Sea Scrolls, the Isaiah commentary, you read, quote, The end of days, this concerns the reduction of mankind the remnant of Israel as the assembly of his chosen one, could they be the 144,000 in Revelation 7? Um, very well could be. We'd have to look at it and see. So at the end of days, the end of days could be the end of the age of Torah when the Messiah comes the first time, or the end of the age of grace when the Messiah comes the second time, in which case that would probably be the 144,000. Or many times they talk about everything kind of repeating in cycles. Sometimes it's actually both. So that's why we can go back and look at the events very clearly, very closely uh, during the time of the Maccabees in the first century and see what happened and get a, an idea of the kind of things that are happening at that point. And then kind of see, you know, if we're going from here to there, which direction would be going what would be happening in politics and in wars and things like that. So, yeah, very well could be. You talked about the dream that the two fallen angels had. They asked Enoch for an advice. Uh, Enoch told them to repent. They perished because they committed an unforgivable offense or didn't repent. Yeah, um, and I... It's interesting to me because most people have the idea that fallen angels can't repent or that the Nephilim can't repent. And maybe some can and some can't or whatever. I don't know. But the fact that Enoch would make a comment like the it's it's being destroyed, I would advise you to repent. Now, you could say um, that it was in a crowd of people or something. Or that he was making a blanket statement, I encourage everybody to repent, mainly focusing on humans, because humans could repent. But even if that's the case, none of the humans repented either. So it is interesting to see, you know, that kind of a thing. I don't know who he was talking with, but I think any godly person would say that. It's like, I, I don't really know if anybody's ever going to get saved. This is the end. But I strongly encourage you to get right with the Lord before you die. I'm just saying. And I could see him doing that to anybody and everybody. So, yeah, it looks like he's talking to the fallen angels, or specifically Huawei, which would be uh, one of the sons of, I think he was the son of Bakrel, something like that, one of the sons of the fallen angels. Um, so, yeah, to me, it's interesting that they would have dreams, prophetic. Another thing, though, if we believe the text, why would God send you a dream that if you don't repent, you're going to die? unless he wants you to repent. Now, if he's going to make it where you can't repent, what's the point of sending the dream? 
we would say, well, so that others would know and others may repent. But if others can't repent, what would the point of be sending the dream? So somebody is at least able to repent. And I think that was pretty interesting. So to me, I'm looking at these things going, okay, that's not exactly what they taught me in seminary. Uh, when we went through Enoch, I, we, I don't know why, or at least I don't remember ever talking about that. But it is pretty interesting, isn't it? I would encourage all of us, even if you think you've committed the unpardonable sin, just repent. If the Lord went to all of this trouble to save us and wants everyone, he, he really wishes all men to repent, I, then I don't think he's going to say you're gone. So just repent. Question, is there any mention of a Pangea before the flood? And if so, wouldn't that mess up locations? Um, yeah, a lot of people think there was a Pangea. Uh, I've written about it a little bit on my uh, ancient post-flood history. Uh, and there are some ancient maps that seem to indicate stuff like that. Just some little clues. Um, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, Okay, you're not, yeah, you're not necessarily talking about Dead Sea Scrolls. But anyway, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, I don't know of anything that specifically mentions it. Uh, so the ideas mainly come from Genesis um, that Eden was like the center. And there were, there, it was, Eden was like a small island, so to speak, and surrounded by that. And from the waters there, it went out to four rivers. And it watered the earth. And there were different places at that point. And it should have been somewhere around the, the Persian Gulf in that area. Uh, but yeah, there's nothing that directly mentions Pangea, but there's a lot of hints. It's a lot like people talk about a pre-Adamic world, and there's nothing that directly mentions it. But there's a lot of things that might be hints. Now, the language, I mean, it could go either way. Uh, and a lot of us say, well, you know, if there wasn't one, if there was one, why didn't somebody just say that? Well, why didn't they say it in such a way to make it clear there wasn't one? So it's one of those things you can't just take that. You have to look for something specific. So I don't know of anything specific that talks about Pangea. For those of you that don't know what that is, that's the idea that right now we have uh, seven continents and seven great oceans. And the idea is like somewhere along the line, it used to be one landmass and it broke up into those things. And a lot of even the secular scientists say a long time ago, there was a Pangea and they spe speculate on how the landmasses would may have went together. To the part that we will be judging the angels, does that mean we will be taking their place prior to the fall? Some people think that. I don't know for sure. I just know that we, in, in Revelation, it talks about the fact that we will uh, rule and reign with Christ on earth. So if you're ruling and reigning, uh, like your section, you're at least like a governor or a king of a something uh, or a pre president or something like that. And that gives you the indication of passing judgment. And so we're obviously ruling the uh, millennial reign. Uh, the way Christ wants us to, of course. But so the question would be, how is it that we're judging angels? You know, and it kind of hints there that um, the, their judgment will be at the great white throne judgment and maybe even sooner. I didn't mention it in there, but actually there is a section when you get to chapter 50, anyway, somewhere in, in the book of Enoch, it's prophetically mentioning a time when Israel goes to war with Persia, and which, of course, is Iran. And it's toward the end of the age, but it is not uh, the big one. That's basically all it says. So, so to me, big one might be Gog Magog, or it might be Armageddon, something like that. So it's not, and we haven't, Israel has not went to war with Iran yet. So that means that has to be first before. Armageddon, tribulation period, stuff like that, um, or somewhere in that neighborhood. So, but it looks close. And I mean, it looks like it could happen at any minute. So to be told it's not the big one, at least, is kind of an interesting thing. Um, oh, but I mentioned that is in the, in the text that mentions the war between Israel and, I and Iran, it actually mentions that the problem starts 
with some of those fallen angels. And that's really all it says. So I could be reading it wrong, I suppose. But to know that there are fallen angels that caused problems that were chained up so they can't cause problems, to say now that they're causing problems between Israel and Iran, how could they be unless they've been released? So it's an interesting thought. It's like, are there some angels that have been released? Or maybe they haven't yet. Maybe they'll be released at a certain point and within a couple of days cause a war. It's hard to, hard to understand some of those things, but it's really interesting to see this consistent theology all the way through the scrolls and all the way through the prophecies. Taking their place, I don't really know for sure, though. I heard Dr. Ken Wilson discussing Calvinism with Dr. Langton Flowers. Okay. He mentioned the Essenes at Qumran were heavenly, were heavily deterministic, i.e., believing God controlled everything, large and small. What are your thoughts? Um, yeah, I can see that. I think that's true with everybody that believes in prophecy. Uh, they consistently talked about we need to pay attention to the prophecies. All their commentaries, like in Habakkuk and Nahum and all those things, they consistently talked about, here's the proper way to interpret it. This part is referring to us. This is when this took place. And so that would be very deterministic in that sense. God controls the nations, controls the prophecies, etc. Um, that doesn't mean that they were Calvinist or were not Calvinist just on that. But yeah, th that whole concept of God being in control. So I don't see anything in there that would make them Calvinist in that sense. I mean, they, they also talked about things like uh, um, you would have to be uh, become a believer, be uh, following the spirit, be a son of the prophets, go into their order, follow everything. And then they talk about how if you fall away, if you reject it, or maybe you were pretending to be or whatever the case may be. When they find out that you weren't, you are excommunicated. They wouldn't kill you necessarily unless you tried to attack them, but you, you would never be allowed back. So to have discussions like that, for instance, is showing that we don't necessarily know everything. And he looked like he was a Christian, you know, a believer, seemed like one. And maybe some of them definitely were and will tell you I've changed my mind. Well, that means you're not, you know. So it's that whole concept there. So, I mean, you could still do that inside of a Calvinistic framework, but it doesn't seem to me that they were Calvinists. But definitely very, very focused on prophecy and God being in control of everything. Melchizedek could be considered the last of the Noahic covenant, a part of the Jebusite Shemite clan. Oh, OK, I see what you're saying. Uh, yeah, the, the person that was Melchizedek. Uh, a lot of people think Melchizedek, the, the one that the Melchizedek that blessed Abraham in Genesis 14 was an actual person. I mean, that, that, he, that was his name, Melchizedek. And Melchizedek means king of righteousness. And so it's actually a title. And it may have come from something else, too, because Levi was actually the name of a guy named Levi, one of the seven or one of the 12 tribes. But after that, it became known as Levitical priests or a Levite priest. And so in Revel, in, um, um, in Hebrews, when it goes through like four or five chapters talking, comparing priesthoods, you can tell if you look at it real closely, we're talking about the Levite priesthood and the Melchizedekian priesthood. We're not talking about any particular person, but the way the priesthood works. And so the old texts talk about the Melchizedek priest that blessed Abraham at that time was Shem. And there was a lineage of, of uh, priests that came down all the way down through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. When Jacob broke up the priesthood, which is a king, priest, prophet combination, the Levitical Levi and his sons became the priests. Judah and his sons became the kings. And then the prophetical stuff went elsewhere. And so that's the, the basic teaching. So some people would say Melchizedek was a Christophany. 
or a guy from the Noahide covenant or something like that, which that would have been true, not any, no matter how you look at it, because there was no Mosaic law at, the, at that time. But yeah, Melchizedek at that point was a priestly line, and there would be several of them. We do have a book on the Melchizedekian priesthood from the scrolls. Genesis 1.26 of the Jerusalem Targum says angels were created the second day of creation. But this is not mentioned in the second day narrative. Is, it, is this considered to be true? Um, the, the Targums are Aramaic translations from the Hebrew. So I'm assuming, and I haven't went through everything, but it looks like they're really it's a really good translation. But the other thing that it, uh, the Targums do is that they'll add commentary. Some of the commentaries are, are obviously correct and amazing. And then others like that, I'm not sure where they would get that unless some prophet told them that. So I wouldn't consider it necessarily to be true. Now, one of the other things that I always point out when it comes to the Targums is in its Genesis or Exodus. I forget where, but I think I have to be you know, anyway. It's talking about one of the guys migrating from where he was living down this direction and then the process of moving it says that he stops by the tower of edar and uh that's all it says in, in the hebrew in the in the uh, targum it says the same thing he stops by the tower of, of edar and it adds the, uh, a little bit of commentary it says this is where the messiah's kingdom or the messiah will first manifest and it's interesting when you look the area of the, the Tower of Edar, it's around the area of Bethlehem. So when Jesus was born, it's interesting to note that the angels first appeared to the Bethlehem shepherds. So yeah, Messiah's first appearance uh, or acknowledgement was there around that tower. So it's really interesting. And that, that would be way, way before um, there was a... Um, a New Testament. So it's really interesting to kind of see that. That I don't know, though, for sure. Uh, if all the angels were created on the second day of creation, I don't know. It seems like there's problems no matter how you look at that. So I honestly don't know about that one. You said that Jude quoted Enoch and his Enoch's end time prophecy. Do you think his son Methuselah and grandson Noah knew about the prophecy? Uh, and that motivated them to live righteous uh, in an unrighteous environment. Yeah, I definitely do. One of the texts uh, in the Testament of Noah makes mention that he was studying the old scrolls to try to figure out what to do when, when the ship landed, basically. And according to the Book of Enoch and the other Testaments, um, they all knew about prophecies. Josephus will quote Adam's Testament. In which Adam said that there would the earth the earth would be destroyed twice, once by water, once by fire. But he didn't seem to know which one would be first, but he just got that. And then Canaan later said, Okay, this is the way it's going to work. It's going to be first a flood, secondarily a fire. So we've got all of these things. In the in the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, we have a small piece of the Testament of Enos. And Josephus quotes a small part of Adam. So you've got Adam. Seth, Enos, and Canaan, it being mentioned at least that they had them and or a small piece. So each one of those guys did that. So they knew about the prophecy of the flood and of the fire, uh, among other things. So yeah, I definitely would think uh, that would make them live holy. As a matter of fact, one thing that's interesting, Noah's a prophet and he uh, names his son Methuselah. So Methuselah, if you break this up, meth means death. Selah means to send, like an apostle or Shelyak, something like that. So Methuselah, if you put it together, can form a sentence, when he is dead, it shall be sent. Now, if you look just at Genesis and you go through that, you'll see that Methuselah died the same year as the flood. If you look at the other texts like Jasher and some of the others, you'll notice he died exactly one week before the flood. And then, of course, Genesis in both places tells us that 
Noah entered the ark one week before the flood came and God shut the door. So it's like Methuselah literally died and was buried in a morning. That afternoon, they were already in the ark and God shut the door. So in the same day. Uh, but at least Genesis has it the same year. So if you think about that, uh, Enoch named his son, when he is dead, it shall be sent, Methuselah. So think about that. Every time Methuselah doesn't show up when he's supposed to, and it's getting dark outside, is this the end of the world? I mean, it will be one day. He dies, and when he's when he dies, we're all dead. So that's real. I mean, if you believe the prophecies, that's really going to make you think, hmm. And I think a lot of these things are that way. If you just knew the language and just had eyes to see, as the scripture says, just look at that kind of stuff. But what does Enoch mean? Dedicated. What does Methuselah mean? You know, what does Canaan mean? You know, stuff like that. Can this be a, a prophecy? And I think that's definitely true. And I think Peter, you know, alludes to that in Second Peter, I think it's Second Peter 2. He talks about how you know that there was a flood and you know that there will be a fire. You know, the fact that the number one happened, number two definitely will too. So that should make us decide to be godly. I mean, if you keep that in your mind. So Peter even mentions that too. And Enoch chapters two to four. Trying to understand the purpose of Israel as a called out people, aside from bringing forth the Messiah in the redemptive plan of God, especially since we see Gentiles were not required to convert to Judaism. Um, I think it was mainly, and of course, I, there might be a lot more than I know, but I think it's mainly the whole idea of being separated from the world, mainly worshiping one God, the temple or tabernacle and then the temple, the temple rituals and all those things pointing to the Messiah. You know, like when we do a Passover Seder, you can clearly see the Messiah in the ritual. I think that's pretty much what it is. The Gentiles, I think almost every Gentile nation went polytheistic. I don't know of any Gentile nations that worshiped one God. Uh, there were pockets in each one that did, but they all became corrupt. Of course, eventually Israel became corrupt too in different times. But yeah, it's, it's interesting to think about that. There's probably more to it than what you and I are thinking of. So thinking along those lines and seeing what we can come up with would be interesting. How did Isaac Newton prophesy the 1,000 year reign? Did he know about the ages? I don't know if he know, knew about the ages or not as far as the way the scrolls teach them, but he did. He wrote a commentary on Revelation and he wrote a, uh, a commentary on the science of the Magi, the prophecy in the stars, and he used at one point, he did a, a compilation based on Revelation, Daniel, and Kings and Chronicles. And I don't think it's surviving exactly how he put, you know, added them together. But the result is mentioned in two or three of his works. And so his concept was the second coming should be around the year 2060. And I always thought that was interesting. It's like, okay, well, it's... That's in the ballpark for what the scrolls have, more or less. So it's interesting to see. I would really like to see how he got that. See, because he's probably a few years off one way or the other, according to the scrolls. But who knows? It would be really interesting, though, when somebody says, well, according to the, when I run the scriptures through my gematria or whatever, this date pops out. Fantastic. How are you getting that? So, but he, he was pretty interesting. He did a lot of interesting things and seemed to be 100% correct in a lot of his theories. So we'll have to see. Why does Satan appear as a serpent in the garden? Also, why do serpents get punished if Satan was just appearing as one? Seems like something deeper is going on. Yeah, I would agree. I, and I don't know why specifically. Um, some of the things that have been pointed out is that Satan uh, is a name for adversary. And it's not just the one leading it, but there's a, a group, a large group of angels that fell back then. 
Uh, in Isaiah 14, it mentions that Lucifer, or Hillel is the, the actual name, and in, in the King James it says Lucifer, son of the morning. Uh, but he is a the one that you know was in the Garden of Eden and, and tempted and that kind of stuff. But it mentions that he is a, a fallen cherub. He was a cherub that covered. And a cherub is different than a seraph. A seraph is a winged, fiery serpent-like creature, uh, angel. And a cherub is more like a minotaur. Uh, the cherubs have four wings. Uh, seraphs have six wings, you know, stuff like that, according to the way they're described in scripture anyway. And so it's interesting that uh, if if Lucifer, Hillel, is uh, a cherub, why would he appear in the garden as a seraph or a serpent, in, in other words? Um, and there's there's probably a lot more to the story than we know of. The thing about Genesis is you got to remember the first six chapters gets us from creation to the to the flood, and that's 1,656 years. So there's no way you can do a, a fairly, I mean, even a real quick run through of everything in six chapters. So you can tell it was very, very cut down. I'm not saying that Moses didn't write it or somebody edited it or whatever. I'm just saying that Moses is basically saying, okay, this, this, this and happened, and that's the stuff we know about. Now we're starting with me and going forward. And that's basically all he did. But there's a lot that could be added. And I think the manuscripts from the Dead Sea Scrolls and other places give us a lot of clues. Understanding they may be garbled, especially going into multiple languages and other things. So we got to take them with a grain of salt compare them to things which is why we're doing this enoch study the whole idea that there's so much detail about the fallen angels and the nephilim we pretty much know for sure that's what moses is talking about in genesis 6. so yeah as far as that goes there's got to be more to it than that was it just satan or some other fallen angel under satan's authority possessing a snake was it a seraph was there a reason why it's a serpent it's, it, yeah, there's got to be more to that there. Do you think Ham, Canaan are descendants of Cain, perhaps? Uh, no, the descendants of Cain were all wiped out. Uh, uh, Ham was one of the one of the children of Noah. Canaan and Nimrod are from his side of the family. And basically all tried to take over and recreate the empire. And in the process, tried to become... Nephilim or tried to recreate those. You see Canaan doing that in Canaan. And then in one text, it talks about Nimrod becoming a Gaborim. And that could just mean mighty men, you know, but there's a lot of other mighty men. It seems like it means something a little more. So, and there's some other texts that talk about the history. So it'll be kind of interesting to go through. But no, I don't think they're directly from the pre flood guy named Cain. In the fallen angel history, you said that the fallen angels metamorphosized in order to mate with women, but you also said angels are male. So why did they have to metamorphosize? Um, don't know for sure. That comes from the writings of Clement. Clement was a disciple of Peter. And according to what he said is when he became a Christian, he uh, came to, to Israel and hung out with Peter and everybody, mainly Peter. Uh, in, in Israel in that area. And as he began to learn, he says in his memoirs that it dawned on him that this is a lot like Greek history. But if this is correct, the Greeks have got a lot of things garbled. Uh, apparently accurate history, but just messed up pieces of it. So he goes to Peter and says, I'm beginning to understand that we were right in a lot of things, but we got things mixed up too. So can you just tell me in a nutshell start to finish and he tells you what peter told him just all the way through to adam to jesus christ you know real quick synopsis and that was one of his his questions it's like wait a minute if they're angels how could they meet with women and have any any kind of kids giants or whatever how how in the world would that happen and according to him, Peter explained that there was some sort of metamorphosis. Apparently, angels can kind of like come and go as they please. Once these guys fell, they were kind of locked for whatever reason or however that works. So they were still much more intelligent, 
um, apparently had knowledge and powers and stuff that normal humans don't, but they were in no way uh, equal to what they were before they fell. And so don't know all the all the details to it, but that's what the text uh, seemed to indicate. It's interesting that the, no matter what we do, the more text we find that answers the questions we want to answer, somehow that always leads to more questions. So it's something we'll keep working on. Did Mary descend from King David since David told Solomon that one of our daughters will become pregnant? Joseph and Mary weren't yet married. So was there part of her family? So she wasn't part of the family when she got pregnant. Good point. Yeah, there are uh, some of the genealogies of Mary. And um, of course, now she doesn't necessarily count, but you'd, you'd, she'd have a father. And from her father and mother, there'd be, you know, sets of grandparents and it goes on back. But supposedly, and I don't have a complete record of that, but it's supposed to exist in a couple of places. Um, some of the church fathers talk about it. But apparently Mary is a direct descendant of Levi and Joseph. Not Joseph, excuse me. Levi and um, Judah. Uh, so it's like when the clans come together somehow. So we know that, for instance, her cousin, Elizabeth, was married to Zechariah. Zechariah was a priest. So Zechariah properly has to be a direct descendant of Aaron to be, or Levi at least, a Levitical priest, to be in the temple doing those things. Even if he was an Essene, he would still have to be, to do the rituals, he'd have to be from that lineage. That doesn't necessarily mean that Elizabeth had to be, because she can marry into the family, but it's something along those lines. So in a lot of the texts talk about Messiah coming through Levi and uh, Judah. So I think it's really interesting to kind of see that they might be referring to Mary's genealogy. So yeah, there's, I can't prove that, but there's a lot of like hints like that, that seem to be pretty interesting. Did anything in the biblical history happen at the end of a jubilee? God bless you too. Um, yeah, actually, there are several several pieces that um, talk about the whole idea of the ages and the idea that prophecies may happen at any time because they're just, you know, history in advance being told. But a lot of the prophecies start at the beginning and end of an age. So like all the first coming prophecies 2000 years ago, all the second coming prophecies now, and we've had quite a few over 50 uh, fulfilled in the last 100 years or so. Um, something at the end of a jubilee, there are, yeah, there are several things like that, like Jesus coming and his death and, and all that is in the first Shemitah of the last jubilee of that ona or that, that age. So it's interesting to see that kind of thing. So yeah, there does seem to be a precedent for that. And so that's why we're saying that even though we've had a lot of prophecies fulfilled, a lot of little ones, Israel comes back, they come back on the right day, they bring the Hebrew language back, not on the same day, but in the in the centuries, they take back Ashkelon and Ashdod, they start from the center part, the people flee to certain places, the uh, uh, West Bank is created. Gaza Strip, Strip is created, Jordan is created. Those are all parts of prophecies. And then these other things that happen. And then there's still stuff that hasn't happened, like the war with Iran and the several other things, Psalm 83, stuff like that. So, yeah, it's really interesting to see that. And, of course, that's kind of iffy. But if nothing happens for another year or two, then obviously it is all going to happen in that last jubilee or that last generation. We live in exciting times. Uh, want, want us all to be wise of prophecy, good witnesses, but also uh, be there for one another. Um, local churches are the best if you have a good local church focusing on prophecy and herbal medicine and things like that. Super Chat, $15. Thank you very much. Been really blessed by your Monday night studies. God bless. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, we really appreciate all you guys donating through Give, Send, Go and 
PayPal and super chats and things like that and buying the books and helping us study. Just helping us study is, is amazing. Some of these questions and then when we come up with something, somebody will find a text and let me know about it. Maybe I don't know where it's coming from or whatever. Uh, so there's been some interesting developments even this year with some of those manuscripts. Per the Church Fathers at the end of the age, 2032, the Dead Sea, the Dead sea Scrolls say 6,000 years, A.D. 75. Could the statement about unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be left? Yeah, connected with that. I'm not sure what that means exactly, but that could definitely fit. So the Dead Sea Scrolls proper have the end of the age, like the year 6,000, which, you know, we would assume is second coming or, or more or less. It'd be in that area anyway. And then if you just take the idea of Jesus, the church age starting and Jesus' death was in 32. So 2,000 years, which is a, a proper age, that'd make it 2,032. So we still have that 40-year gap, just like we did back then. So what is the 40-year gap for? Does the second coming happen, you know, in about six or seven years? Or is it 50 years? Or is it somewhere in between? Or those are, those are things we don't know about. We just know the, the, uh, the time or the season. This is another reason why we can't set a date for the rapture or the second coming or anything. We know they go together. We know in a certain pattern, but we don't know for sure. See, I would have assumed that the Messiah would appear and do everything in 75 AD, according to their calendar. But he was born in, of course, then again, you got to remember he had to be born this that, that time. So he's born in 2 BC, died in 32, age of grace, or age of church age starts. Temple destroyed in 70. The Essene Temple shut down in 73. 75, the Council of Yavne, and then the, the other people trying to bring it back. Uh, 135, the Bar Kokhba Rebellion. So there's lots of things in there in that time period. Continued. Oh, could it mean to apply in the last 50 years? Um, yeah, I think so. I think a lot of prophecies uh, happen. If, if we're being told it's in the last, at the beginning and ending of ages, um, that would definitely be the, the jubilees around the end of the ages. So I, I'm thinking, I would agree with you. I would think the, the last two or three generations at least. And the last three generations of this age on their calendar would run us back to the start of the 1900s which we had the Balfour Declaration, 1948, 1967, 1973, and all those other prophecies. So yeah, I I fully, anything could happen, so we need to be careful. Um, I mean, you could always have a, a plague, uh, an attack of an invading army, a natural disaster, persecution, anything could happen at any time. But it sure seems like, to me, I'm really looking for things to not really do much different at all for the next two or three years and then things begin to start rolling that's just my you know guess except i really hope the rapture might be like this week you know would it be possible will it be possible to do a quick study or a look into what prophecy is left before the coming of the rapture uh yeah we did we've done a little bit of that when the war started with israel in October of 23, uh, I was at a Prophecy Watchers conference and I came back. And so we took a few weeks and uh, and they, they should still be there on YouTube. I need to kind of redo some of the playlists. But we looked at Hamas, um, Golan Heights and uh, several other groups or, you know, like Lebanon, Southern Lebanon, what happens. And so those are things that happen. They may or may not be before the rapture. But there are several things that happen before the second coming, that's for sure. So, yeah, we will definitely do that. Prayer request for my husband, who is uh, a who is in a steep and sudden decline. The doctors don't know why. Please pray that he will pass quickly or recover and reconcile with his children and brother. Lord, we just ask uh, that our, our brother here... Um, get his life straightened out. We ask for a healing if possible. 
And in whatever the situation is, we just ask that you touch him and let the family use this situation or let it help them to understand that we all need salvation and let them guide all of them closer to you rather than far away. We pray this in Jesus' name. Yeah, that's many, many times. I always pray for when you don't know if somebody's going to die or not. The main prayer is that the people that aren't saved or aren't walking, that this wakes them up. I think we all have prodigals in our uh, in our families. When Jesus drove out the demon from the epileptic man, he said, this kind can only come out by prayer and fasting. So we are not spending enough time in prayer and fasting if we want to see it done. Uh, that's a definite possibility. I remember when I first looked at that, I was looking at the critical text. This is a great example of why I use a King James, New King James, the, the TR versus the critical text. Some of the critical texts will cut out fasting, and there's one set of critical text that I don't remember which translation it was based on, but it literally cut out every reference to fasting from the New Testament. And so when I learned that, I thought, okay, well, that's it. It's just prayer. There's no fasting involved because it didn't make any sense to me whether I ate a sandwich or not. What would that have to do with a demon when I say leave? You know, it didn't make any sense. So it's like, that's probably something else. Uh, but then I realized that that was, those were later manuscripts. And when you have church fathers, uh, 50 to 100 years before those earliest manuscripts quote this and say prayer and fasting. There's no way around that. It's prayer and fasting. Um, and I don't know a whole lot. There's a lot of theories on why fasting would have um, any bearing on that. My theory is that prayer is prayer. We should always be praying. Fasting uh, is kind of like, well, the, the words circumcision, fasting, and baptism have religious meanings. So technically, baptism is when I get dunked in water, water baptism, like taking a bath, that kind of thing, but in ritual form. Um, however, Jesus said when the disciples wanted to rule with him, can you be baptized with the baptism I have to undergo? And he's referring to his death on the cross. Uh, that's in Matthew. So baptism means something that you have to go through to get somewhere. I have to study. I have to go to seminary. I have to go to work to make money. It's something that I have to do to get a result. I can't avoid it. I have to go through it. Um, circumcision of the heart. Uh, basically, a circumcision is a, is a ritual you do with the physical flesh. But it represents a circumcision of the heart and the idea of taking off an outer layer to make things tender is what we're talking about. So some people can get calloused or prideful and a circumcised heart means put away your pride, understand that you're a sinner, just repent and accept the Lord. Well, I don't want to cut it out and do it anyway to get rid of the pride. And so with that uh, fasting. Is kind of the opposite of baptism. Baptism is something you have to do to get something done. Fasting is something you have to avoid to get something done. And it might be just a temporary thing. It's like if I wanted to become a mature Christian, I've got to study my scriptures and, you know, say I don't know hardly anything about them. I'm a new believer. Well, but how do I do that when I work 40 hours a week? And I'm doing something every night with family or bowling or whatever, taking trips or whatever. I don't know, but you're going to have to fast something or you can't study. You're either going to be fasting the study or fasting the objects. You got, you got to cut something out of your schedule, in other words. And what I'm thinking is, that's kind of what Jesus meant here. The idea that this kind would go out by prayer and fasting. If you would have spent the last five or 10 years praying and studying and leaving all the extra, you know, fishing and getting married and all that kind of stuff, leave it alone for a while, do this first. If you would have fasted a secular life for the religious studies 
and now have gotten married and had a family and got a job and gotten rich and all this stuff, you would have known what's going on. But because you didn't study, you have no clue what's going on or how to take care of it. Now, obviously, prayer is part of it, but it sh shouldn't be that hard for you guys. And this is an example of why you need to fast some of these things. And that makes sense to me because, again, um, like I might be a good teacher and I don't see how I could teach better or worse right now if I would or would not have eaten a sandwich for lunch, you know. And, and maybe it is, maybe it's something else, but I'm thinking this is more like I need to put away a lot of stuff. Like I know people that love to study, but they also love to play computer games. Uh, put the games away for a while and study. And you can always go back to playing games. Nothing wrong with it, but there's too many things we do today and we just don't have enough time. You have to make time to study. And I think that's what he's talking about there. Is it possible that Azazel was the serpent in the garden? Perhaps that's why all sin was like accounted to him. Very possible. Um, again, Satan is, is Hasatan. It means the adversary. And they're all connected together. If Azazel and the 200 fell with Lucifer, and they just happened to be like a small group of the big group that did this genetic stuff and were severely punished for that, uh, either way, whether it was a second rebellion or just a, a fragment of the first rebellion, these guys were severely punished for doing the genetic stuff. Lucifer and his normal fallen angels apparently didn't do the genetic stuff or he wouldn't be free to roam around. So the question, you know, could Azazel, maybe Azazel was a fallen cherub, not cherub, seraph. It's a possibility. It would, it would kind of make sense, something like that. We can't, that's just speculation. We'd have to find some manuscript that actually says that. As far as I know, there isn't one, but that's a very good guess. I, I think there's, it might be the case. What are your thoughts on Elon Musk's Neuralink implantable chip into enhance human abilities to manipulate the DNA? Think it's a think this is a precursor attempt to enable to control and hacks for the Antichrist. Um, it definitely is. The, the whole concept of the scrolls, this is totally different. This is electronic, but the whole concept of the scrolls and what we're reading here is that there was genetic tampering. Now, granted, it sounds great to say, if I can change, you know, drink this drink or let me give you a shot or whatever, and it's going to change your genes and you're going to have superhuman strength and you're going to be super smart. You're going to be as gods, so to speak. You're never going to get sick because I'm going to make your immune system twice as powerful. Well, you maybe you can do something like that. But the problem is, is this a well-known science or is this a shot in the dark? And maybe you are successful, but maybe you also get cancer and die. Or, you know, so, or maybe both. So they did the genetic tampering. They knew what they were doing and they were successful. At least the angels did. Um, and then the other stuff got really messed up bad is what we were reading. So the bottom line is, according to the scrolls, not to use Nephilim medicine, anything that changes the genetics. Now, I, it would be great if we could eliminate cancer and all this other stuff by changing the genes. But according to the scrolls, every time this has been tried, disaster occurs. So, and I'm not trying to tell anybody what they should or shouldn't do with medicine or whatever. I'm just talking about scrolls, this kind of thing. So in this case, it's not medicine, but some sort of a link between computers and this. So if it made you smarter, you could get work done faster. Th that sounds fantastic. But what if there is a problem? And that's what we're talking about. Now, granted, they're trying this stuff, from what I understand, on people that can't walk, that are dying or whatever, can't see. If they could bypass some problem, <clears throat> maybe they could fix it. But even if that's the case and there's no downsides to the technology, what kind of thing would happen when somebody decides to misuse it? I mean, what's going to happen when they decide to implant chips in soldiers to give them strength and accuracy and whatever? 
and maybe make them go ahead and pull the trigger when they're not supposed to. I mean, you don't know. That's all speculation on my part, but any kind of new technology you have to be careful with. So, yeah, it definitely sounds, um, knowing about the Antichrist and the, uh, the Mark of the Beast, knowing about the genetic tampering from the angels, and then looking at this, it does seem kind of spooky. And we should be, in, in, again, if the, if the last generation or the last jubilee starts in another year or two, then we, if it takes some more time to perfect, if it doesn't work, then nobody can use it military antichrist so somebody would have to perfect it if it's got anything to do with this at all so that takes time so you should be experimenting on it now if the last generation starts in two years so this is the time period why did satan tempt jesus in the wilderness didn't he know who jesus was it's a good question i'm not exactly sure um because if you know who he is you know he's not going to fall Maybe just as a, a last resort to see if you could tempt him. I, I don't know for sure about that one. Except to say, Satan is a lot more powerful than any human being, but he sure does seem to make some bad choices. So I'm just, you know, he's not, I don't know. He's just weird. You could repent maybe and be in God's grace and you decide you want to take over. The guy's insane. Any evidence of the shepherds who the angels appeared to became followers of Yeshua in latter years? Not that I know of. I don't think there's any text that talks about them, per se. I mean, I'm sure they would have. Obviously, they knew about that. They were waiting, and they got to see the Messiah. Seems like they were believers, but uh, don't know for sure. That would be interesting, though. Was the tree of good and evil in the Garden of Eden a literal tree? Yeah, I think so. I think it was. Um, I think it's got, and I don't know all the details to it, how it changed the genetics or what it did. It caused a sin nature, but it seems to be something actually changed, changed us to give us a, a sin nature. That had to be something real. So no, I don't think it is symbolic. Uh, good evening, everyone. Could we be seeing Hosea 5 right now, mitzvah? This is in Gaza and Tabor in the West Bank, which are the Edomites. Uh, Hosea 5. I have to look that up and see. But definite possibility. Let me find my e-sword. I've got way too many things open here. Yeah, let's see here. Hosea 5. Let's see which one that is. Yeah, we'd have to look at that and see, but there's a lot of stuff like that. There's a lot of good commentary, especially Habakkuk, and I'm sure Hosea is the same. I would really like to see full commentaries from the scrolls on their interpretation of these prophecies. I think it'd be fantastic. So we'd have to look and see. Okay, uh, let me go ahead and, yeah, we'll stop there for tonight. Next week, we'll continue on the Nephilim history part. And I'm excited to get that done and then go into the prophecy part. We'll, we'll come back in Jubilees and other stuff and fill in some of the gaps as we go. But um, tonight was just the prophecy of the birth of Messiah being 70 generations, which gives us a lot of clues on a lot of things. So next week we'll continue up with that. But there are some prophecies about shepherds and rulers of Israel going from the beginning all the way through when they come back in 1948 and continue, there's some really interesting prophecies out of Enoch and some of the others. So we will see you next week. God bless you guys. Have a good week.